Good evening, everyone. Good evening, I'm Selena Anderson, director of the Center for Literary Arts. On behalf of the directors and staff, I'm pleased to welcome you to our first reading of the season with Wasu, author of Stay True and winner of the 2023 Pulitzer Prize in Memoir. This event is made possible thanks to the continued support of the Martha Heasley Cox Lecture, this general, generous endowment created by San Jose State Professor Emeritus Martha Heasley Cox, established an ongoing series to bring celebrated and influential authors to San Jose. CLA has an exciting lineup of authors this year, including Wasu, uh, San Jose uh, Kaming Chang, the fall 2023 writer in residence, Colin Winnett, Percival Everett, novelist and former youth poet laureate of Oakland, Layla Motley, and rising star Kate Folk. For more information, please visit our website, San Jose. Dot, or excuse me, CLASanJose.org. I was on autopilot there. CLASanJose.org is our website. In just a moment, Wall will read from Stay True, after which he will be interviewed by Vanessa Waugh, and lastly, we'll take questions from the audience. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and Ryan will come around with the microphone. Uh, after that, we'll have um, the book sale and signing. So for if you would like to purchase a copy of Stay True, you can do so by making a $26 uh, dollar donation to CLA, or to Santa, uh, excuse me, to the Center for Literary Arts, and that will come up in a second where you can make your donation. Um, and we'll do that at the end of the program. Okay. Wasu is the author of two books, including the best-selling memoir, Stay True. His memoir was a top 10 book of the year at the New York Times, of the New York Times, and named a best book of the year at Time, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and more. Wa is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a CBS Sunday morning contributor. He teaches at Bard College and has previously taught at Harvard and Vassar College. Please join me in welcoming Wasu. everyone for being here. Thank you so much to Selena, um, everyone at the Center for Literary Arts, uh, all the wonderful students and faculty of San Jose State I met earlier today, the, the staff at the Hammer. Um, it's really awesome to be back. I grew up not too far away from here. Um, I grew up buying records, buying books, sort of within a, a mile radius of here. So it's been really great to be back here today and uh, you know just to have a chance to um, see this space differently than how I remember it as a teenager, which is something I'll talk about in a sec. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the book and talk about, um, I guess, <laughs> what the book is about. Uh, and then I look forward to talking to Vanessa. Back then, there was no such thing as spending too much time in the car. We could have driven anywhere so long as we were together. I always offered my Volvo First, it seemed like the cool, generous thing to do. Second, it ensured that everyone had to listen to my music. Nobody could cook, yet we were always piling into my station wagon for aspirational trips to the grocery store on College Avenue, the one that took about six songs to get to. We crossed the Bay Bridge simply to get ice cream, justifying a whole new mixtape. There was a 24-hour Kmart down 880 that we discovered one night on the way back from giving someone a lift to the airport the ultimate gesture of friendship. A half hour drive just to buy notepads or underwear in the dead of night, and it was absolutely worth it. Occasionally, a stray, scratchy pop tune would catch someone's attention. What's this? I'd heard these songs hundreds of times before, but to listen to them with other people is what I'd been waiting for. Passengers had different personalities. Some called shotgun with a neurotic intensity as though their entire sense of self relied on sitting up front. Sammy flicked her lighter all the time until one afternoon when the glove compartment caught on fire. Prague always ejected my tapes and insisted on listening to the radio. Anthony, forever staring out the window. You might come no closer to touching another person than in a cramped back seat, sharing a seatbelt meant for one. I had taken my parents' fear of blind spots to heart, and my head constantly bounded from side to side 
checking the various mirrors, noting cars in neighboring lanes in between, sneaking glances to see if anyone else noticed the pavement was far superior to Pearl Jam. I was responsible for my friend's safety and for their enrichment too. In general, I wasn't used to seeing Ken in the back seat. We spent a lot of nights driving around Berkeley, his leg propped up on the passenger side door, his eyes scanning the horizon for undiscovered coffee shops, some out of the way dive bar that would become our haunt once we turned 21. He was always overdressed, a collared shirt, a polo jacket, things I would never wear. But maybe it was just that he was ready for adventure. More often than not, a song's drive to 7-Eleven for cigarettes. At that age, time moves slow. You're eager for something to happen, passing time in parking lots, hands deep in your pockets, trying, out, trying to figure out where to go next. Life happened elsewhere. It was simply a matter of finding a map that led there. Or maybe, at that age, time moves fast. You're so desperate for action that you forget to remember things as they happen. A day felt like forever. A year was a geological era. The leap from sophomore to junior year of college suggested unprecedented new heights of poise and maturity. Back then, your emotions were always either very high or very low, unless you were bored, and nobody in human history had ever been this bored before. We laughed so hard we thought we'd die. We drank so much we learned there was a thing called alcohol poisoning. I always feared I had alcohol poisoning. We stayed up so late, possessed by delirium, that we came up with a theory of everything, only we forgot to write it down. We cycled through legendary infatuations sure to devastate us for the rest of our lives. For a while, you were convinced that you would one day write the saddest story ever. So um, this is not the saddest story ever, I don't think. Um, it's as much about grief and loss as it is about memory and love and friendship and things that uh, are meant to evoke joy. Um, but a lot of this book, uh, and if, you're, if you haven't read it, it's a, a memoir about, um, uh, I guess ostensibly about uh, the years 1995 and 1998, um, and sort of the, the friendships that, and the people we encounter in college, uh, not just college, but at these pivotal times of life who sort of stay with you, and the reasons one might revisit those friendships um, uh, and think about them and write about them down the line. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, a lot of the book takes place in Berkeley as well as in the East Coast, but a lot of it in a very oblique way is actually about growing up here in the South Bay. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the past year, the book came out about a year ago. Uh, I've been away from home a lot. I live in New York right now. And you know, when I'm away from home, I often am thinking of where I would prefer to be rather than sort of on the road. And I, f I found myself this past year thinking a lot about growing up um, in Silicon Valley, in San Jose, Cupertino. Um, living on the East Coast is very strange because uh, when I started living on the East Coast in around 2000, I would just say I lived in San Jose because nobody knew what Cupertino was. And now everyone knows what Cupertino is. And they assume that I grew up like on, uh, like on the campus of Apple or something, <laughs> even though um, circa 1985, like nobody cared about Apple. Um, and it's very hard to explain that to people. But um, there's something about the process of writing about oneself and trying to not just get facts right, but get textures and feelings and rhythms right as well. And so I spent a lot of time as I was writing this book over the past 20 years, thinking about the hours I spent uh, on Bascom, driving back and forth from <laughs> Big Al's to Tower Records and back, uh, and back, eventually Rasputin's worked its way into the rotation, um, about all the different places I would get burritos, like I, I was happy to see, like is Iguanas still here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Super Burrito, near oh, Kiss, oh. yeah, there's like, so many sense memories um, that I would try and conjure as I was working on this, even though the book itself doesn't really take place that much um, in this area. But as I was walking around San Jose State earlier today with my friend and former high school debate partner, Harish, 
Um, you know, we were just sort of reminiscing about how um, sophisticated coming to downtown San Jose felt uh, from Cupertino and just sort of like going to, was there a place called the Opera Cafe? Max's. Max's, okay. Uh, clearly not everyone has been to this establishment, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, there was just something incredibly thrilling about going to a like diner that was just like seven miles away from the normal diner you went to. Um, so, you know, all of which is to say, it's just been really fun to kind of think about this. And as I was coming here today, I, I flew in this morning, I was thinking about how one of the best shows I've ever seen was just a few blocks away um, at a coffee shop. Uh, I think Joseph is here, right? Yeah. Uh, Joseph, AKA Joseph. Um, yeah, Justin and uh, this guy Rafiq. Uh, and, and so much of what I try to do in my work is to sort of like recover these memories that only the people who were, who were there could possibly remember. And to write about these things like this bubble jacket show that remains etched in my mind as though it was Dylan going electric or some <laughs> or, or, or um, Woodstock or something. Because not only do these sort of, because you know our friends deserve this because uh, the people we encounter deserve this sort of uh, to be written about, to be remembered. Um, and that's sort of the, the sort of guiding principle of the book is how sometimes it's hard to appreciate the degree to which uh, we are already surrounded by the uh, sort of influences or, or heroes uh, that, that we, we are seeking in our lives. So I'm gonna read a little bit more. I usually don't read from this section of the book, but um, it seems very appropriate to read from this section that's about uh, being a teenager in the South Bay. There's a telos, is it telos or telos? Does anyone know? <laughs> telos, okay. Um, there's a telos of self-improvement baked into the immigrant experience. As a teenager, I busied myself with the school newspaper or debate club because unlike with math or science, I thought I could actually get better at these things. You flip through your father's old physics notebooks, and you know in your bones that these formulas and graphs will never make sense to you. But one day, you realize your parents speak with a mild accent, and that they have no idea what passive voice is. The next generation will require a skill on their behalf, one that we could use against them. <laughs> Commanding the language seemed like our only way of surpassing them. Home life took on a kind of casual litigiousness. The calm and composed children a jaunty bounce to our sentences, laying traps with our line of questioning. The parents, tired and irritated, defaulting to the native tongue. I spent a lot of time with my mom. She drove me all over the South Bay to cello lessons, cross-country meets, debate tournaments, record stores, listening as I regaled her with the minute details of my life. In return, I waited patiently with a stack of magazines whenever she went shopping for blouses or shoes. She watched whatever weird movies I brought back from the library, and she taught me how to shave. Every Friday, we went to Valco, our local mall, starting at Sears and working our way to the food court for dinner. If anyone in a store wanted to talk to you, she said, you replied as cheerfully as possible, I'm just browsing, and they left you alone. I would explain what everyone else was wearing at school, and then we would figure out where you could possibly buy that stuff. There comes a moment for the immigrant child when you realize that you and your parents are assimilating at the same time. Later, I understood that we were both sifting, store to store for some possible future. That we were both mystified by the same fashions, trends, bits of language. That my late night trips to the record store with my dad had been about discovery, not mastery. Later still, I came to recognize that assimilation as a whole was a race toward a horizon that wasn't fixed. The ideal was ever shifting. Your accent would never be quite perfect. It was a set of compromises sold to you as a contract. Assimilation was not a problem to be solved, but the problem itself. So my solution to um, sort of this casting about for an identity as a teenager was to collect records um, and to make zines, which I would try and get people to sell along Bascom, but nobody ever really took me up on it. Um, thankfully, in retrospect, um, and this last part that I'll read is about that time. 
I began making a zine because I'd heard it was an easy way to get free CDs from bands and record labels. But it's also a way to find a tribe. My worldview is defined by music. I cultivated a pose that was modest and small, sensitive and sarcastic, skeptical, yet secretly passionate. I scoured record stores and mail order catalogs for seven inch singles that sounded quiet and loud at the same time. I thought I had a lot to say, but I felt timid about saying it. Making my zine was a way of sketching the outlines of a new self, writing a new personality into being. I was convinced that I could rearrange these piles of photocopied images short essays, and bits of cut up paper into a version of myself that felt real and true. It was a kind of dream about what the future could hold, something that came into focus with every pun-filled, reference-packed sentence. Of course, there are many sentences I couldn't yet write. I used primitive page layout software I'd persuaded my mom to buy because it would help me with college applications. Using four or five fonts per page communicated the sense of emotional chaos I hoped to project. <laughs> I illustrated my zine with collages using images ripped out of driver's education manuals, magazines, Chinese textbooks. I wrote a lot about music, but I could have been zealous about anything. Film, literature, art. I fell in love with anything I felt I had discovered. I wrote long, admiring essays about pavement and polvo because those were the first LPs I bought on my own after finally getting my driver's license. And I listened to those records obsessively until everything strange and dissonant about them began to sound normal. But I could have started browsing the R section instead and fallen under the spell of other bands just as easily. What I prized was seriousness. I wanted to apply it to some small world hidden in this larger one. So the book sort of is roughly about that idea of uh, kind of where one's own small world fits into these larger worlds, how we um, kind of finesse those differences and sort of how um, what we should actually be paying attention to isn't maybe the larger world, but then the small worlds of others uh, that, that are very close to you. Um, it's really good to be home and uh, yeah, thanks for being here. by someone with the last name, Vanessa? <laughs> or, exactly. <laughs> it's a double Hua night. I, think it, this is, I don't think this has ever happened before in the universe, so this is pretty special. <laughs> um, well, I absolutely adored this book, as I think many people in this room did as, as well. Um, it resonated in so many ways, um, not only because I'm of that era, uh, now that we're officially part of the olds, I guess. Um, but I'm also from the Bay Area. I also did debate in high school, though LD and not Ox. Um, and we can debate the merits of that afterwards. Um, but I, uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed um, what you selected. And I, I want to talk a bit about zines. Um, and just, um, I have a friend, Vanessa Chan, who mentioned that you're actually working on a zine right now as a she fundraiser. She mentions you in, in her entry. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so you were still doing zines, or is this just a one-off, or? I do, yeah, I do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I do, um, writing the book, like I was saying earlier, I mean, when I was writing the book, I thought so much about, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't write a book that was supposed to be nostalgic to other people. Yeah. Um, even though I think that's out of my control, but like, I was really trying to just evoke the contours of what a teenager's life in 1995 or 1996 was. But while I was doing that, I was looking at a lot of things I used to make and thinking about how the older you get, the less time you have to do things just for fun uh, or, or for, for free. Um, or for no reason. Yeah, or for no reason, right? Um, and I was really drawn to, I don't know, just trying to remember what that was like, right? Because I now work as a journalist, so I don't just spend my Friday nights making a zine just for myself. And so I guess it was during COVID, I did start making a zine again, but 
it's an interview zine where I just talk to people about their their passion for music and sort of what they've done. So the first issue was um, an interview with this guy who was a high school student in the 90s in Berkeley, and he did the art for all these like great hip hop artists. The second one is about the Vietnamese American new wave scene uh, of the 80s and 90s. Um, the third one is about this club photographer in the 2000s. So I still make them, and I think for me, the idea of it being just a zine, like Are they edition, handmade? Yeah, yeah, they're handmade. Um, but they're only being like 100 to 200 copies. It, I feel like there only need to be 100 to 200 copies. It, and that, that that sort of like honors what it is that they were doing. The thinginess of it. Yeah, and, and that's sort of like, that's something I started thinking about a lot with the, this is an incredibly circular answer. But, <laughs> but like, I think that there are certain, there's like the right length for my book was less than 200 pages. Like mm -hmm. it was much longer, but that felt right. The right circulation for this like story of this scene that I'm trying to capture my scene is like, one to two hundred copies. Like it doesn't. Everything doesn't need to be everywhere, right? Like the way the internet wants us to think. So, uh, yeah, incredibly long answer to a short question. Yes, I still make zines. But uh, <laughs> so how does how does one get a hold of this these special edition zines? Uh, there's like an Instagram account called Suspended in Time. That, okay. Uh, this is not meant to be spawned for uh, my zine, but um, yeah, there and then. The zine that you're talking about is a fundraiser for You and Me Books, this bookstore in New York City, Chinatown, that is, was devastated by this fire. And next week, um, we're doing this fundraising party for them. And so like, I, ha I made this zine for next week where I just sent a bunch of writers um, a prompt of like, tell me a memory from book shopping, mm -hmm. or tell me a memory from a bookstore. And so that's what that one is. That the other, one of the other Vanessa. The other Vanessa, right. <laughs> uh, the time you two were in conversation. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and in Stay True, you include a welcome note from um, an old issue of, of a college zine, and you, in it you say, nobody will um, know what you didn't say, if that makes sense, so go out there and shoot a video, make some racket, Xerox a zine, and make your own indelible mark yeah. on the world. Um, and you talk yeah. about uh, bringing the zines into free magazine racks at cafes and getting it stocked in the late great Cody's bookstore. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about this. And I think you've already touched upon it, but like, what does it mean to sort of follow your passion in ways that are not meant to be monetized or pre-professional? And like, is some of that being lost these days, or like, what just what does it mean to to go to go after something because? Not because you're like, I want to become a journalist someday. Uh, that's a really tough question. Uh, I don't know if things are being lost because I'm beyond, I'm like beyond washed. So it's like, it's not, <laughs> I'm not the generation, I'm not of the generation that is like immersed in that question yeah. firsthand, right? So I'm sure there are ways in which like my the students I teach feel as though they're doing the same thing I was doing, right? Yeah. And then there's a way in which what I was doing seemed like, BS to people who are older than me. But I do feel like it's much harder to do things and have like this limited blast radius. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like the idea of doing a zine for me now and just it being, you know, like there's a couple hundred copies and that's it. Um, yeah, that that gives you it, it's not the it's not meant to be precious. It's just sort of like, well, this is just a, a story you encounter it great if you don't you know that's fine too uh, I do think it's much harder now to live outside of the logic of virality mm -hmm. and of just uh, of like clout or just like being present online so I think people try and think of ways to create alternatives within that but uh, like I have a hard time processing how that works because to me everything is just sort of ensnared yeah, well, my, so one of my sons, I have twins, and one of my sons, even as, uh, even a couple years ago, it was like, I want to be an influencer. <laughs> and he was like filming videos, and he, he had yeah, to come up with content. Yeah, like he was filming, first he's like, okay, I'll film um, like cars on a track. 
not like who's gonna watch this, but we all made sure to write our relatives to like help drive up the page, yeah. the, the clicks. Um, Wait, your son did the cars on the track? No. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So it's just interesting that, um, or even when I remember being a kid, like making a book that had a title page and it was like checkerboard press, New York, Orinda, yeah. and like making the thinginess was like really, but now they have publishing tools where, I remember I spoke at a high school and this, one of the students said, oh, this is my third in the trilogy. And she was like 15 <laughs> and she had self-published everything. And so it's just interesting kind of like the, where we are now. Of course, there's always been different tools available. You had PageMaker in high school. Yeah. Like, I and, and, it, yeah. and, and just what um, that, that idea of like, is just like a cloistered or curated audience yeah. even possible anymore? So, or is that even what they want? No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what young people want, but um, yeah. I think. Uh, but you know, as it, when I was writing the book, I didn't mean for it to. You know, whenever I'm teaching college students, mm -hmm. if I assign something, like I'll assign something that like Lucy Sant wrote about New York, <laughs> downtown New York in the '80s, and sometimes students will feel attacked, as though the point of this is to condemn their experience. 2021 as like crap compared to how real New York in the 80s was. And that's never, that's never the intention of the piece or of me, but I think increasingly in society, it's just much harder to talk about the past, talk about history, but also to um, kind of allow the contradictions of the present and the past to just be a contradiction, you know? So it can't be resolved. Right. Yeah, so like when I was writing the book, I didn't want it to be like, man, it was sick when I had AOL <laughs> and, like, and I traded cassette tapes and I bought records and they were cheap. You know, like I didn't really want it to be a celebration of like this time that like I look back fondly on. But if you were to time travel into 1996 and tell the characters in this book, someday there'll be a way for you to hear any song by typing it into this like, Box. This, like window, <laughs> yeah. then uh, everyone in this book would have wanted that, you know. So it's not. It's hard for me to. So so the the idea is like it's hard for me to be, like I can be nostalgic for my own. <laughs> Many of us are nostalgic for our own teenage years, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't want a reader to feel as though they had to have that same. Right, and I, it doesn't, well, granted we are part of the same generation, <laughs> yeah. but I didn't feel that sense of judgment at all. In fact, it felt almost like sort of a continuous like call to action of like that still, that still d that desire to, to say that thing, to make that zine, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I was also wondering, um, like you're a collector in the book, are you still a collector of, of albums, books, people, what have you? <laughs> yeah. <That's>, um... <laughs> Uh, not, yeah, I, I collect a lot of things still, but they are different things that I used to collect, if that makes sense. Do tell. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, what are they? Oh, oh. Um, this is going to sound really weird, but um, <laughs> I collect, I collect like found photos. Like a like a photo that's on the sidewalk or like ripped out. I'll of pick a up magazine. a photo off the sidewalk, sure. But yeah, uh, yeah, just like uh, uncredited random photography. Like from a thrift shop or uh, like on eBay on the thrift shop. I mean, a lot of people do this, but I'm like so. Part of the reason I do this is because uh, when my parents my parents took a bunch of photos on their honeymoon and they lost all of them. And I wish they had them, because it would be really cool to see this like road trip through uh, along the East Coast and Midwest from like the early, from the mid 70s, like with them. And so I collect, it's impossible, there's no way I'll ever find them, but I collect ran, like ran, found photography of mid-century Asian Americans. That's amazing. But out of a sense, like, even if you, well, that would be the plot of a movie that if you, you came across their photos. That would be like a horror film. <laughs> right. like, but just, but just that, and honoring that, that idea of a lost photo. Like, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that was like a trigger just to, uh, and, and I think it goes to this thing of writing criticism for so long, 
uh, where like I'm interviewing like the star mm -hmm. and now being more interested, this is like tangential to the book, the experience of the fan or like the, the like devotee, mm -hmm. like I'm way more interested in that stuff. So like I find, I think the lives captured in these photos are probably just as interesting as the lives of like people, like famous people from the 1960s or, or sort of key figures in Asian America, whatever. But um, I'll never know, but it'll, it's just kind of very uh, humbling to see these images and to kind of like imagine these, these families. They're very full lives that yeah. were. I also collect um, press kits of, uh, of music I liked as, when I was a teenager. So they're, at this point, they're vintage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because as a music journalist, I was, I was sent so many press kits. And it's sort of like, you know, like, new Backstreet Boys album. And then it has like the talking points for how they want to sell the new Backstreet Boys album. And after I saw, stopped writing as much music criticism, I became really interested in how much of my consumption of things I liked when I was a teenager was just straight out of like the PR, <laughs> like talking points of like, like here's how you sell Nirvana's Nevermind. Yeah. You know? So um, yeah, that's another thing that I, I collect. Um, like seashells, uh, <laughs> restaurant pens. Um, <laughs> We could, yeah. Yeah, so, no, no, this is totally fascinating. Pharma, <laughs> uh, pharma memorabilia. Uh, I have this giant bear capsule paperweight. <laughs> uh, There's nothing like pharma uh, swag from its heyday. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it, this kind of leads me to like a thought. I was talking about this with um, Selena beforehand, just how, uh, you know, my freshman year, I'd send emails to my dad to his, AOL account for my college account, and then he'd print it out, and he'd like put it in a binder. And it felt very special. To, and I, I thought about how he came to this country with not many mementos as uh, a Chinese yeah. immigrant. And so, um, but then, so, you know, where, what is the relationship, if any, between like hoarding and collecting? <laughs> and do you, do you kind of see, are they related at all? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I think they are, but, um, and I think that there's different, psychological compulsions, obviously, that, yeah. that are related there. But um, what's weird for me is that uh, as I was writing this book, a lot of it is about not necessarily collecting, because it's not like I was collecting um, like the material effects of my college friends. Like uh, right, for a, uh, right, with, with like, again, to that idea, like it, there wasn't a point necessarily at the time. Yeah, yeah. But, but what I mean is, um, you know, in the, the book is very much about like friendships, right? Yeah. And so I had all these like things from, from that period that I would keep in this one envelope and I would always take it with me everywhere I went. I mean, if I was like moving houses, that would be the thing that would be in my backpack. Yeah. I wouldn't trust the mover. Um, and it was just, you know, ticket stubs, uh, uh, an old airline, t uh, like old airline boarding pass, a uh, pack of cigarettes, a pack of tissues, a map. Um, and these were things that I was treating as though they were a collection. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and they were things either from like, you know, the last party that I, went, I was at with Ken or just sort of like things from that period of time. Uh, are items of clothing, but after writing the book, my relationship to that collection of things has really changed. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Do you um, do you still have that envelope? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. I still have all these things. I still have all the faxes with my father that yeah. I quote. I quote at length these faxes that my dad and I exchanged in the early '90s, but um, they're they, they, included in the book. They no longer seem um, like talismanic. Whereas I once thought that these items contained some mystery that I could understand. Does, do you, does that make yeah, sense? And, yeah, but do you think that's because you've now written about them? I think, or yeah, time it's passing. Not because, or, it's not because I figured it out, but yeah. uh, I think putting them in a narrative or putting them, turning myself and other people into characters and turning these things into items that these characters held in their hands, yeah. like changed my relationship to these things, if that makes sense. Well, and I know um, 
from the memoir, I know you started writing portions of this book even around the time of Ken's death, and yeah. um, it, you know some of it ended up in the eulogy, and then you were, as you mentioned, you worked on this in the last 20 years. Um, can you talk about what it's like to work on something over such a long period of time? And then I also know um, you had a Cullman Fellowship that you, um, that's, if you could talk about what that is and how it means to be working around archives and how that kind of shaped your thinking around this book. What was the first question? Oh, sure. Just um, what? Uh, just what's it like to write, uh, work on a project over such a long period of time, and not even kind of knowing what it is you're writing towards, but just wanting to get it down. Um, you know, I I've been working as a journalist for I don't know, like twenty plus years, so not having a deadline was very liberating, mm -hmm. right? And and what I mean is, I'm very I always try and meet my deadlines. Like if I always try and be professional with my editor, so I'll stay up till five finishing things if I have to. But having this thing with no deadline sort of allowed me to, I don't know, just to live with it more. Mm -hmm. But I think the longer it took me to, or the longer, the more time I spent with it, the more I began to wonder what the point of it was or how true any of it was. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that taking so long allowed me to understand that what I was writing or what, I, what, what ended up becoming the book wasn't necessarily, I don't know, that it was like a story and that I was a character in a story, right? And that there's a version of the events in this book that are something that I experienced, that some people in this room experienced, and that that's separate from the book. Mm -hmm. You know, that's separate from the thing that gets uh, narrativized. And I don't think I would have ever understood that when I was 21 and writing things down like furiously the day after because I just never wanted to forget what this joke was or what this reference was. I think back then I was really trying to write, and like there's this image of the asymptote that I read, that I, that I mentioned in the book. This is a mathematical thing where um, two lines, I think, approach, but never touch, right? So I think of all writing as like asymptotic, asymptotic, where you'll never actually achieve what it is you want to do, right? We're but just like, shadows on a cape, right? Yeah, but like, you know, infinitely these two, th you, you may one day get as close as you can to describing what you want to describe. And I think for a while, especially when I was in my 20s, what I was trying to describe was uh, not what I ended up wanting to describe. Right, but you needed, to, but in, in a sense, those aren't wasted pages. You needed to get, you need to write those things to understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I mean, I think, um, yeah, and I think not having a deadline and doing it for myself allowed it to be for me and something that I wrote purely to understand something about myself and that once I finish that, which is like two and a half times longer than this book, then I could detach myself from it and say like, okay, well this part can just become this story that someone else reads. Mm -hmm. to, to separating yourself from it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereas like I was so inside of it and I was so attempting to kind of live in the past through my writing. That was sort of the aim of my writing was to write myself into the past. Um, but the longer it took and the older I got, the more I realized that I should be writing into the future and sort of taking the past with me in the future. So uh, I don't know if that makes sense. No, but definitely you're the, the, where, it's where your eye is aimed. Yeah. Yeah. I think the way I think about it, and I didn't really realize this at the time, was, you know, I read the part where I said, uh, I, forget, I, I don't want to misquote myself. Um, <laughs> For a while, you were convinced you would one day write the saddest story ever. You know, like, I think that that was the goal because that's how I felt at one point, right? But then I realized when I, I realized much later that, like, you can be happy and sad at the same time and one doesn't diminish the other, right? That you can mourn and grieve but also discuss the joy 
that gives that grief such meaning. Yeah. You, you know, and that that doesn't diminish or abandon. That doesn't sort of like that's not a an abandonment of the past. That's actually just sort of like an explanation of 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 like why one would think that one would write the saddest story ever. Right, or that you can hold that contradiction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can sort of do these things at once. Yeah. And so that's not something, that's, that's another thing that taking 20 years um, allowed me to, I don't know, kind of understand as desirable or as possible. Uh, yeah, so the fellowship. Oh, right, right. Just, <laughs> I mean, yeah, the Coleman Fellowship has produced such, um, like, uh, Hernandez's trust. He had that fellowship, and like that book is so interesting in its sort of like thoughts about archive. And I know Pam, Pam Jung had the Coleman Fellowship. So I'm just, what was? Could you talk a bit about that, and if it kind of made you think about sort of archives, personal or collective, um, and and like kind of what it means to have like an official record of things, and yeah. you know what's what's hidden, what's lost. Um. Funny that you mentioned Hernan Diaz. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if folks have read Trust. Uh, he won Pulitzer as well. Um, really great novelist. Great book. Yeah. Um, I don't know him, but he's actually in the book. Oh. Because I went to a party at, at his apartment, and I didn't realize it, but um, <laughs> but it's very it's very strange. But he, there's a scene in the book where I'm at a party, and it happens to be at his. Oh, I, okay. I didn't know him at the time. Uh, so it's this fellowship where. Like, you go to the New York Public Library every day. If you don't go for two, more than two consecutive days, they say that they'll fine you. So, uh, and, and like, writers generally don't do well under those kinds of <laughs> conditions because, um, you know, part of writing is just sort of being uh, beholden to your own muse, right? Yeah. But it's, it's sort of like treating writing like a nine to five job. And, my year, I mean, every year it's like there's a poet, there's a couple novelists, there's philosophers, there's like people writing uh, reportage. And the thing I actually learned, the, the thing that really stuck with me was I'd never, I don't think I'd ever really hung out with any novelists before. <laughs> and I came away with such an admiration for how much, how much, Research and thought can go into a novel that does not at all appear on the page. You know, yeah. like as a journalist, I want to use every good quote that someone tells me. Uh, like I, when I'm writing like criticism, I want to like, I want to show my work constantly. Like I want the reader to think like. Wow, this person really went in depth on the history of pockets. Or follow my tracks. Yeah. yeah. Um, like this is an unexpected turn, but like this is really enriching my understanding of the subject. Whereas with the novelist, they would be reading these things, and I would say like, your books are about, you know, two people, like your books aren't about the history of uh, pre-Christian religion, you know, like <laughs> right. you, I don't see that in your books at all, like, but that's actually what my books are about. Yeah. And I was just really impressed with how their world building wasn't just like, oh, I thought of this cool city where these two characters, were. it was so much more um, like comprehensive than that. Yeah. And uh, I, I know this, this might seem like a really obvious thing, but like I just never really appreciated that sort of the intellectual scaffolding that um, novelists, uh, this is, this sounds like I'm like criticized, that I'm like, <laughs> this is not like, no shots at novelists at all, but I just mean like, right, I, right. I was like just really amazed by what all the novelists were reading and sort of how they were comfortable not showing all their work. Yeah. You know, that so much of it was about illusion or um, symbolism or, or sort of like approaches to writing that are so foreign to being a nonfiction writer. Or as they say, going in through the window versus through the front door, so. Yeah, um, so, I've never heard that before, but that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have more questions, but I do want to have leave time for audience questions. Yeah, sorry, I'm rambling. Oh, no, no, this is, <laughs> I'm like transfixed. Um, does, oh, yes. Hi, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks um, for being here, too. I have two questions. One is. Oh. 
Oh, hi, now you can hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two questions. One is, what did your teenage friends call you? What was the name they used to call you? Is there an answer to this? Wait, do you? You should ask your teenage friend. You mean like? <laughs> Wait, do you know the answer to this question? Or? <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a riddle. I was oh, no, just curious no. what your friends called you by name. Wa. <laughs> no, they would call me Wa. Yeah. Yeah. But my name's actually Hua. But I, <laughs> but I mispronounce my name routinely, um, just for whatever reason. So they would call me Wa, but uh, it's actually Hua. It's. Do you ever say, to, to, to try to explain Hua, sometimes I say, like, the end of Chihuahua. I have never said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it gets at the, uh, the sound. No, 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 but I mean, I, I think I was, uh, I was just being, uh, yeah, no, I would say, no, I, I yeah. Let's not go, yeah. But there, you're, I mean, you do have nicknames in the book for, in college, it seems like. Hua scene? Yeah. My email address, yeah. Yeah, so that was my email address. I, I was just I think curious. Very few people call me, like Ken called me that, but mainly just, I think, to make fun of me. <laughs> I, I was just curious about how the, the mispronunciation came oh, through. Oh, okay, but that's yeah, funny. that was purely my fault. Oh, okay. uh, I would say, wa, like water without the tur. <laughs> uh, and then now I'm like, it's not actually that, it's wa. So. Although I, I did tell someone once that I was meeting to interview them, I said, I told him my name, I showed up, and he thought, he was shocked I was Asian, because he thought my last name was spelled like Evelyn Wa, <laughs> like W-A-U-G-H. So, so, yeah. um, so my second question is, uh, you had mentioned that once you had finished your book, your relationship with your collection of collectibles yeah. shifted, and I was curious to learn more about how it shifted. You know, I think um, for a while, um, for a while, I viewed a lot of these things, and, and like when I'm talking about that, I mean things that specifically pertain to like my friendship with Ken in the book. So it was like syllabi that we read together, or like this film script that we were writing together, or um, movies we went to see. Together. So I. For a while, I just kept everything in an envelope thinking that they were clues to something, not a mystery necessarily, but that if I just sort of like arranged these artifacts in the right way, I would be able to make sense of something. There was nothing to make sense of necessarily, but I just sort of saw them as having a, um, I don't know, just being charged with, obviously they were, they were incredibly meaningful because you know when when there's loss your narrative continues and theirs does not right so all of a sudden there is this sort of closure to a narrative and it sort of becomes how you understand um, the person who's no longer there so that's obviously a reason why I was so kind of enamored with these objects but I think I also just thought that they could um, you know it's like if you pick up an old book and you open it and it smells a certain way. And you think like, oh, this must be what 1911 smelled like. You know? Or if uh, you pick up an old record and like a receipt falls out of it from the previous owner and you feel like some connection to that past, I felt like this would keep me connected to the past. And uh, yeah, I don't necessarily feel that as strongly now, if that makes sense. Other questions? <clears throat> Hello. Um, so this is kind of like a two-parter, I guess. So you said you were working on this um, originally. It's like a personal project for quite some time and not quite sure where it was going. Um, did you have any idea where it could have gone and what was some of the first things you actually wrote about? What did you actually put down uh, when you began, uh, began this project? I mean, I guess when I started, uh, there are parts of the book that were written um, just 
like hours, hours after, uh, after we all found out what had happened. So I guess when I started writing, it was in this journal that is part of the envelope. It's still something that uh, I'll write in occasionally. But um, it's this journal that I went out and bought that day. And I don't know, it was just sort of me trying to process, like kind of addressing him and being like, crazy that, you know, what happened, you know. Uh, and then it's, yeah. So a lot of it was just kind of raw emotion. And uh, I don't know, talking about like what happened that day and uh, certain things that I didn't want to forget about, um, you know. And they could be like quite mundane things. Like today, like, you know, Prague Rose and I went to King Dong and we ate Chinese food and we talked about this and that. Like, so a lot of it was just very mundane in a way, but also just out of this radically hope, radical hope that I could communicate with like a ghost, you know, that, that there was some, uh, someone reading what I was writing. Over the years, I would go back to that document and that journal um, a, a couple times a year from like, I don't know, 1998 to 2014, 2015. And then in, when I got the fellowship is when I started actually like putting it all into like a single document to try and figure out what was, what, what I had been doing all this time. And I think, yeah, it wasn't chronological. It was just sort of this, um, sifting through these notes and figuring out like, what did this mean? Like, why do you keep saying this? Um, and, and just trying to remember um, where I was when I, did, when I wrote certain things down. Uh, as far as like what it could have become, there was a version of it, because I think part of what, one of the questions that I'm sort of left, that, I mean, there was a part of it where I was like, oh, maybe I'll write like a short story in here that'll be in here, that'll be like, or like maybe there'll be a, a zine inside here, but uh, I couldn't really figure out how to do, it, how to work it in any other forms, so. You've had a lot of hats to wear as both an academic, as a journalist, and now as a, a um, well, I think you know the Pulitzer brings you into something that is different than journalism, obviously, and more of this kind of like literary uh, great. Would you, um, where would you see yourself on a, like now you know you're gonna be on syllabi, right? You're on my syllabus this semester. <laughs> and I'm wondering where, do you, where would you like to be? Like what would you imagine if your work is gonna be in the classroom, who else would you like it to be in conversation with? Wow, that's a really, Great question. Um, I don't know. It's trippy to be on any syllabi, honestly. Um, I know that that's a weird thing to say, but uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's weird. So um, I guess like Maxine Hong Kingston, because I actually copied a lot of her work in this book. Um, Pharaoh Sanders, but that would be a very multidisciplinary course, I guess. But uh, I mean, I think that there's, uh, I think I, the models that really, I was really fixated on as I was finishing the book were things that happened to be like, kind of happy and sad at the same time. And so that's why Maxine's work is so important to me and Pharaoh Sanders' work as well. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's very humble. It's it's strange because I've worked as a critic and an academic for so long, and so I'm used to being the one unpacking someone else's work. So the idea of being unpacked is like very strange <laughs> and, and, and daunting, but um, very humbling too. So I think we might have time for one more question. Actually, I can talk loud enough. Being streamed. 
Oh, okay. Oh, is it? Okay. Ooh. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I actually wanted to ask. Uh, obviously, the accident, you know, led to the creation of this book. But uh, if it hadn't have happened, do you think it would have changed your life in a big way? Had. Uh, so, so the, uh, the death of your friend. Uh, if if that hadn't happened, do you think you'd be here now? Do I think what would? Sorry, do you think you would be here now? Oh no, no, I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot because, and I think, I also wonder whether we would still be friends. You know, I think that so much of my understanding of uh, friendship, duty, um, community. It was like a lot of it was kind of through the prism of this moment for me, which isn't to say that I suddenly became a really great present friend. Like it's not that's actually the opposite. But I think by the end of this process, like probably in the past few years, like I've begun to kind of appreciate more um, the impact, but also the sort of reality that, um, yeah, like who knows, who knows what might have happened. Um, and that's why in the book I sort of, I'm like, yeah, who knows, like maybe, maybe if this hadn't happened, we would have lost touch, but we would have only emailed when like the Padres won the game or something. Um, but I mean, personally as a writer, I don't think I would have, I don't think I would be here because writing is not, uh, even though what I've written for the past 20 years, like criticism or uh, reporting, has very little to do with what the book is about, in the back of my head, I was always thinking about like, well, like this is all like practice or something else you want to do. That thing you want to do may never be published, but it's something that you feel like compelled to do. So I don't know if I would have had the that like desire to continue writing had I not had certain scenes or moments or memories that I wanted to one day be able to write. So I don't think, um, yeah, so for a variety of reasons, I think, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be here. And that would be totally cool. Oh, I, yeah, oh, I, I, we just have the speed round. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Just before, uh, thank you so much for um, such a great conversation for these uh, wonderful questions for the audience. But I just wanted to close out with a few quick questions. There are no right answers. Tommy Boy or Billy Madison? Billy Madison. Pearl Jam or Dave Matthews? Pearl Jam. <laughs> Pearl Jam is actually good. Yeah. Foucault or Derrida? Oof. Uh, Nice. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess Derry Dawes, since I quote him more. Yes. Blond I understand them fully. So. Yes. Uh, blondies or fat slice? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> this is tough. I actually like blondies more, but I ate at fat slice more because it's closer to the record store. Yes. Well, next question. Rasputin or Amoeba? Amoeba. Okay. And last question. Bizarre love triangle or always on Bizarre my mind? Bizarre love triangle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wa. Um, buy books over here. You can buy books by donating $26 to CLA, <laughs> sanjose.org. <laughs> the QR code will come up here. And also we have uh, copies of Vanessa's book as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.